Hi, our goers. Welcome to the Chapter 7 review video. Today, we're going to be talking about alkynes and all the classic reactions that we see with alkynes. So the first thing we're going to talk about is alkyne acidity. So if you recall back to Chapter 4, which was acid-based organic chemistry, one of our trends for acidity was is that the more S character something has, the more acidic those protons will be. And the rationale for that was is that the S orbitals are relatively close to the nucleus in comparison to those P orbitals. So the more concentration of S orbitals in the center is equivalent to being more electronegative. Okay, so if we classify the hybridizations of alkanes, alkenes, and alkynes, we remember it's sp3, sp2, and sp. So if there is, for alkanes, one s orbital for four total orbitals, that means that we have overall 25% s character, 25%. For alkenes, where there's one s orbital out of three total, we have 33% s character. And for alkynes, where we have one s orbital out of two total orbitals, we have 50% s character. So again, we said the more S character something has, the more acidic it is, so we can rationalize that alkynes, or the protons attached to alkynes, are going to be the most acidic. Okay, so let's see that in action with the first reaction, so acetylide addition. So, you know, what's not explicitly drawn here is that there is a terminal proton, okay, and we have this reagent called sodium amide, and NH3 is just ammonia, and that's the solvent. So this is just a solvent, we don't really have to worry about that. But this is the first reaction where we see something called equivalence, and all equivalence means is it's the stoichiometric um, ratio between your reagents and your starting material. So, you know, if we have one equivalent of sodium amide, we're reacting completely with the one equivalent of starting material. So we would expect complete deprotonation of all of these um, starting materials in solution. Okay. So the mechanistic arrows look something like this. So we have NH2, which is our base, and there's a spectator sodium ion hanging out. And that base is going to deprotonate the acidic proton on the alkyne. So let's just draw this in green. So we expect the lone pairs from um, NH2 to grab that proton, and then that sigma bond density that bears that hydrogen is going to form a lone pair on the end of that alkyne, forming something called the acetylide anion. And acetylide anions are extremely good nucleophiles. So, you know, these acetylide anions that we generated as a product from step one can extend the carbon chain with an alkyl halide. And let's use our chemical logic to kind of figure out why. Well, you know, bromines or halogens in general are extremely electronegative. So we can rationalize that there is a localized dipole in the direction of the bromine, making that bromine partially negative and the carbon that bears it partially positive. So remember, partially positive things are electrophiles, and we just generated the acetylide nucleophile. So it makes sense that our mechanistic arrows would be the lone pair of that, you know, uh, alkyne attacking that carbon that's electron deficient, facilitating the removal of that bromine. So we're really adding one, two, three, four carbons, you know, to this um, carbon chain in our starting material. So the product of step one and two would look something like this. So this would be, I guess you could say one, two, three, four. Okay, so you can see how we added one, two, three, four carbons to our original starting material. So maybe I'll just number this to help you guys. There was two carbons in our starting material, so there are th those same two carbons, and then one, two, three, four, which we added from that alkyl halide. Okay, so again, what's not explicitly shown is that there is another terminal hydrogen, you know, with that with respect to that alkyne. So in step three, we're taking another full equivalent of sodium amide, and that should cause the deprotonation of all of those protons. So we have NH2, and the mechanistic arrows for that would be, again, those lone pairs grabbing that acidic proton, generating the acetylide anion. And then in step two, we're going to be reacting with CH3CH2Br. So, you know, the product of this step would be something that looks like this. So we see that acetylide nucleophile again, and we're reacting with this, CH3CH2Br. So again, there's a localized dipole towards that bromine, so we can rationalize these mechanistic arrows, and we're going to be adding one, two carbons to that, so our final product should be something that looks like this.
this would be 1, 2. Okay, so that is definitely our end product. So you can see how we have a 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 carbon substituent attached to that cyclopentane. And in our starting material, we only had a 2 carbon substituent. Okay, so this is a great reaction to use in synthesis for extending the carbon chain. Okay, so the next reaction is actually preparation of alkynes from an alkyl halide, and it's called double dehydrohalogenation. So, you know, we do know some reactions to generate, you know, these di-substitute alkyl halides, and that would be subjecting an alkene to, you know, a halogen. So bromine with DCM or chlorine with DCM, you know, we know how to form these double um, di-substitute alkyl halides. So now we have three equivalents, and I'll show mechanistically how each of those equivalents works. So I'm going to draw in the protons that are here. So there's actually one on that carbon and two on this carbon. And the first equivalent, NH2, is going to remove that proton. Let's just say it's going to be this first one. And that sigma bond density that holds that hydrogen to the carbon chain is going to be donated into the ring to form a pi bond. And that facilitates the removal of the chlorine because we exceeded the octet. Okay, So the result of one equivalence is going to be something that looks like that. Okay, so the next equivalent, NH2, is going to do this. Grab that proton, donate its electron density, oh, excuse me, I made a mistake. So the product should look something like this. Okay, so the next equivalent of NH2 is going to remove one of those protons again, donate that sigma bond density in to form a triple bond, and that facilitates the removal of the other chlorine. Okay, so the result of that step would be something that looks like this. Oops. Okay, so we had one, two, three, four, five carbons, one, two, three, four, five carbons. Okay, so that was the result of two equivalents working. And what that third equivalence is going to do is remove that terminal proton from this alkyne and generate the acetylide anion. So we just generated the acetylide anion. Okay, and in step two, we see we have another alkyl halide, so we should be extending the carbon chain by, you know, one carbon and a benzene, so that's easy. I can just do that with this over here, and it's one carbon with our benzene, so one carbon with pH for short, okay? So, you know, we can prep these acetylide anions from a di-substituted uh, alkyl halide and extend the carbon chain like we have just saw with the reaction above. Okay. So the next reaction is halogenation of alkynes, and this is, mimics the exact same reaction that we saw with alkenes. So in step one, we're going to form a bromine bridge, okay? So, you know, mechanistically, it would look something like this. Actually, let me draw the bromine first. Br, Br, okay? And the mechanistic arrows would be, you know, one of the pi bonds from the alkyne grabbing the bromine, facilitating the removal of the other one, and it's also going to come back in a concerted manner. Okay, so we have one, two, three, four, five, six carbons in our starting material. So, you know, the product of this step would be one, two, three, four, five, six. And there's a pi bond between four and five, so one, two, three, four, five. And we just formed this bromine bridge. Okay, and then, you know, that bromide anion that I just generated as a result of that step is going to come in and attack, you know, the more substituted side. But in this situation, we have no difference in substitution. So I'm just going to arbitrarily pick that brom, um, that carbon over there. Okay, so the result is a di-substituted alkene. So it looks something like this. Br and Br. Okay, and then, you know, in step two, we have chlorine under chloroform conditions, and that's going to form another bridge, so let me just draw that chlorine. And the mechanistic arrows would be that pi bond, grabbing that chlorine, facilitating the removal of the other chlorine, and it coming back in a concerted manner. So the resulting structure would look something like this. 
Um, so we have Br, we have Br, and we just generated a chlorine bridge. Okay. Again, there's no difference in substitution, so that chlorine anion that we just generated can come and attack either carbon, facilitating the opening of that ring. And now we have this structure. Okay. So, you know, this is a way that we can add halogens to alkynes. It mimics the same reactivity that we saw with alkenes, okay? So the next reaction is hydrohalogenation of alkynes, okay? And, you know, this is going to go through a carbocation intermediate, just like we saw with alkenes. So, you know, let's just draw HCl. And we can rationalize that one of those pi bonds is going to act as a nucleophile to grab that proton, generating the chloride. And we have a 1, 2, 3, 4 starting material. So we would have 1, 2, 3, 4, and our pi bond is here. And we are going to add a proton to the less substituted position, so that was here. And that generated actually a carbocation here, so that's kind of weird. We've never really seen that before. So we have that carbocation, and we just generated that chloride, and that chloride could come and attack that same position. So the mechanistic arrows could be as such, and the result is this... you know, product from the first equivalents. So there is one more equivalent. So if I had HCl again, the mechanistic arrows would be this pi bond grabbing the proton, generating the chloride. So that generates a carbocation following Markovnikov's rule. So it looks like this. So the hydrogen added here. And now that chlorine can come in and attack there. Okay, so the result is a structure that looks like this. Okay, so just be um, cognizant of this mechanism. It's you know mimics alkenes pretty well, so I don't think it's anything too difficult. Okay, so the next thing is acid catalyzed hydration of alkynes, and you know the mechanism isn't covered, but it's going to go under something called enol to keto tautomerization. So. Notice that these reagents look pretty similar to oxymercuration, and you know some organic chemists call classify this reaction as oxymercuration of alkynes. And you know you can rationalize going through this like bridge intermediate and things like that, but you know you're not going to be tested on the mechanism. But just for your purposes, think about adding an alcohol to the more substituted side because that is what happened with oxymercuration of alkenes. So you know we have this primary carbon over here and we have a secondary carbon over here, so we would definitely expect that alcohol to add on that secondary position. So the result is something that looks like this. So we have two carbons there, two carbons there, and we would expect an alcohol at that position. Okay, so this functional group is actually called an enol. And at equilibrium, these readily tautomerize to something called the keto. And tautomers are just a specific type of isomer that differs in the placement of a pi bond and a single proton. So these readily happen because the um, carbon-oxygen double bond of the keto is a lot stronger than the carbon-oxygen single bond or the carbon-carbon double bond. So, you know, we prefer the keto at equilibrium. So this is the end product. So we haven't really seen a reaction that generated um, uh, carbonyls besides um, ozonolysis of alkenes, and this is another way that we can generate carbonyls. Okay, so for the next one, we, if we were to classify, you know, the carbons around that alkyne, this is a secondary carbon to the left and a secondary carbon to the right. So we'd actually expect a mixture of products here. So, you know, we have a 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 carbon starting material. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 carbon starting material. And that pi bond is between 1, 2, 3, between 3 and 4. Okay, so we would expect, you know, an enol forming here. And we would also expect an enol forming here. And both of those are under gonna go, are gonna undergo tautomerization, so we are going to get something that looks like this. So you'd have to write both on your exam. Okay, so uh, it's pretty, um, I guess, beneficial to you guys to understand how, um, how this um, enol goes to a keto form because if you guys are taking orgo 2, this is going to come back up again. And you're actually going to learn the mechanism and, you know, why this happens more specifically and what drives it towards equilibrium and all that. Okay, so the next reaction is hydroboration of alkynes. So this is adding an alcohol to the less substituted position. So let me just make some more room over here. 
So if we were to classify the carbons around that triple bond, we have a primary carbon here and a secondary carbon here. So obviously we're going to add the alcohol to the less substituted side. So we have a 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 carbon starting material. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 carbon starting material. Okay, And we're going to add that um, enol to the less substituted side. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Okay? And that enol is going to tautomerize to the keto form, but this is more specifically going to be an aldehyde. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Okay, so definitely be careful with your carbons on these. That's why I keep saying those numbers out. Um, you don't want to drop any carbons here. So this would be your product of that. Okay, so catalytic reductions of alkynes. So we can actually um, selectively choose different reagents to manipulate that alkyne to either reduce it all the way to the alkyne, or we can choose to manipulate it to the E or Z alkyne. So let's take a look at that below. So H2 and platinum or palladium or nickel as a uh, metal catalyst, we saw is going to reduce alkenes to the alkane. And it's going to do the same exact thing to pi bonds. So we have a 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 carbon parent chain. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 carbon parent chain. And, you know, we have a structure that looks like that. So no thinking, just take that molecule all the way to the alkane. Okay, so for H2 and Lindler, Lindler's catalyst is going to make this a Z alkene. So we have a 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 carbon starting material. So we have a 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 carbon material. Okay, so there's a reason why I drew 4 and 5 kind of in a horizontal fashion, because between 4 and 5 now we have this Z alkene. And we know it's Z because if I were to draw that, you know, dashed line through this, our highest priority groups are on the same phase. So we have a carbon chain here, that's one, this is two, and over here we have a carbon chain, that's one, and this is two. So you can see how we formed, you know, a Z alkene. And then step two is just an alkene reaction that we saw in chapter six, so this is just syndiol synthesis. So we would expect, you know, a um, racemic mixture of products here that look like this, as well as And that is, you know, um, the first two reactions, and then there's one more. So we saw what H2 and platinum does, and we saw what uh, H2 and Lindler's catalyst does, but sodium dissolved, pure sodium metal dissolved in ammonia is actually going to take this alkyne to the uh, E alkene, okay? So we can expect a product that looks like 1, 2, 3, 4, so 1, 2, 3, 4, and we have this cyclohexane. So the carbon bond is going to be between one, two, it's between two and three over here, and that is definitely going to be a E alkene. Okay? And then step two and three is just ozonolysis, which we know already. So we're going to generate actually um, two equivalents of the same aldehyde. So really the end product is going to be something that looks like this. Okay? And there's really two equivalents of that. But you don't have to rate the equivalencies. Since it's symmetrical, we can just rationalize why there's two equivalents. And that pretty much sums up Chapter 7. So um, remember, Chapter 6 and Chapter 7 is the only material on your Exam 3. So you make sure you guys get all these mechanisms and predict the products down, and you're going to be golden for synthesis. All right, good luck.